three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports, episode 415. I'm wearing different headphones today. I don't like, it feels like a step backwards uh, in my ears. I, I miss the old ones. I had to wear them today because of today's sponsorship. I shot promo stuff a while back using those other headphones. And so uh, to, to make things have continuity, I got to wear the same headphones. Like I wanted to cut my hair. I wanted to get new headphones. But I'm like, wait, I got a sponsorship today. And I filmed promotional stuff a while back with the same hair and the same headphones. So I got to keep that going. Uh, today's episode is going to be really fun. We're doing a turkey debate, which is something I hope is funny to watch and, and really enjoyable. We're also going to talk about NFL Week 11, do the noteworthy nine for that. We'll talk about college football. Uh, I'm talking about Formula One at the very end so that if you're not a Formula One person, you can skip it and move on. That way, I, I always put it at the end so that, if, again, if you're not a Formula One person, hey, no problem. Leave the episode early. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Hisense. Hisense has the U6 ULED TV, the ultimate big game TV. Uh, they are sponsoring and making it possible to have a turkey debate later this episode, celebrating the High Sense Turkey Bowl. Check out the High Sense USA Instagram account. They've got a whole bunch of stuff going on over there. I actually have a High Sense TV. I bought it myself and I bought it independent of this sponsorship. Right now, they are running a 100 day no regrets guarantee. That offer has just been extended. Through the end of the year, Hisense is confident in their product. So confident, in fact, that for 100 days after buying your TV, if you decide you don't love it, they will give you your money back, a full refund. If you're in the market for a new TV, I recommend Hisense. I have a Hisense TV next to me. Again, it's my monitor. I play video games on it. I watch movies on it. I watch TV on it. I watch sports on it. It's my everything TV. I love it. I highly recommend Hisense. And go check out the Hisense U6 ULED TV. All right. We just had NFL week 11. There are nine things that were noteworthy that I want to talk about. Now you may notice that Sunday night football is not here. LA versus Pittsburgh. I want to talk about that next episode. I want to give it the breakdown it deserves and have it independent from the noteworthy nine. Now the noteworthy nine, number one, the Colts beat the bills 41 to 15. This was a massive Massive win for Indy. They are now 6-5, and five, putting themselves in the mix for the playoffs. Well done for the Colts. At this point, Colts running back Jonathan Taylor is arguably the best running back in the entire NFL. The dude had five touchdowns on Sunday. He had 32 carries for 185 yards. He ran for four touchdowns. He also caught one. And by the way, it wasn't like a little screen pass. It was actually a really nice, good catch down the left sideline for a touchdown. I, I think what happened on Sunday was so impressive. The Colts went on the road and dominated the Bills in Buffalo, and the Colts are really building momentum heading into the end of the year, trying to make a playoff push. They're 6-5. and five. Well done for the Colts. Now the Bills. Oh, man. Bills quarterback Josh Allen had two really bad, really ugly interceptions, and the Bills have fallen now to 6-4, and four, and guess who is atop leading the AFC East right now. That's right. The New England Patriots are back. We thought it was the Bills division to lose, and, and it probably was, but right now, the Patriots are back above the Bills, leading the AFC East. The Bills were bad here on Sunday. Home game against the Colts. They fell apart. Uh, they fumbled a kickoff return. That gave the Colts first and goal on the two-yard line. Look, Indy was up 38-7 to in the fourth quarter of this game. I thought the Jaguars' loss was bad. But that wasn't even close to what happened on Sunday. The Bills have to get their act together. This game was awful. And uh, I, man, I, I think the Bills have a chance to win a Super Bowl or be a contender this year. But right now, they look all out of sorts and do not look like a Super Bowl team. Number two, let's talk about two more teams in the AFC South. We talked about the Colts. And now let's talk about the Texans and the Titans. The Houston Texans beat the Titans 22-13 to 13 on Sunday. The Titans have had a very, very weird year. Tennessee is 8-3. and three. They've beat a ton of really good teams. They're 7-0 and oh against teams that made the playoffs last year. But then, Tennessee has two bad, ugly, embarrassing losses to the Jets and now Houston. And you're like, that makes no sense. It's very, very weird. 
Now, the Texans, I, I think part of what's happening here is they're better than I, I expected for sure. The Texans have been competing their butts off in a lot of games, especially with Tyrod Taylor at quarterback. Tyrod Taylor came back as playing quarterback now for Houston, and I really wonder what Houston's record would be if they'd had Tyrod Taylor healthy all year because he is, look, not amazing, but Tyrod Taylor is really, really solid. He gives his teams a lot of really competent, good quarterback play. He had a sweet touchdown run where he jumped over the goal line on Sunday. Tyrod Taylor is honestly underrated. And right now, I look at Cleveland and go, remember when the Browns had Tyrod Taylor? Right now, Tyrod would be an upgrade over Baker Mayfield. And it's a bit funny because Baker once replaced Tyrod Taylor in Cleveland. So you're like, that's that's just brutal right now to look at what's happening in Cleveland and realize how good Tyrod Taylor is playing in Houston. Now, Titans quarterback Ryan Tannehill basically had the worst game of his life. Ryan Tannehill threw four interceptions. Three of them were in the fourth quarter. It, it was brutal, man. Tennessee was awful all around. Uh, they touched a punt that allowed Houston to recover and get really good field position. I think this is the first time since Derrick Henry got hurt where Tennessee really missed having their bell cow running back, Derrick Henry, to just hand the ball off and rely on. And next week, Tennessee will play at New England, which is a, that's a bad, that feels like a really, really bad game for Tennessee. Anything can happen. It's the NFL. I feel like it's been a year defined by chaos, but I'm very, very curious to see how Tennessee will respond next week in New England. Number three, let's take a moment to celebrate Ravens quarterback Tyler Huntley. Baltimore beat Chicago 16 to 13. It was a wild game. Uh, Bears rookie quarterback Justin Fields left the game on the first drive of the third quarter with a rib injury. Andy Dalton, the backup, came in. He threw two touchdowns. Uh, his second touchdown came on a fourth and 11 with a minute 41 left. He threw a long ball, 49 yards for a touchdown to Marquise Goodwin. So that gave the Ravens the ball. Down 13-9 to nine with 1 minute 41 seconds left and a backup quarterback, Tyler Huntley, making his first ever NFL start. He was a, he's an undrafted quarterback in his second year out of Utah, and he led the game-winning touchdown drive in a two-minute drill situation. He converted a big third and 12. It was so awesome. Tyler Huntley gave a really great post-game interview. I, I, just watching what happened, I was so happy. Watching Tyler Huntley have the game-winning drive for a touchdown in his first ever NFL start. It's just a beautiful, beautiful football moment. I had so much fun watching Tyler Huntley get the dub for the Ravens on Sunday. Number four, the Vikings beat the Packers 34 to 31. Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers had a good game through four touchdown passes, but the story to me is Vikings quarterback Kirk Cousins. Minnesota is five and five right now, and this was a massive win for Minnesota. I've been all over the place on Kirk Cousins this year. Against Green Bay, he was 24 for 35 with 341 yards passing and three touchdowns. And this was the moment where I realized I think I'm too hard on Vikings quarterback Kirk Cousins. He's not perfect. Uh, for example, he got lucky at the end where he threw a pick that the Packers didn't hold on to. Like, they didn't complete the catch. Probably should have been an interception. Got dropped. It's little plays like that that make me really skeptical of Kirk Cousins. But when you take a step back and realize what's been going on in Minnesota, I, I, first, there's a couple of things I want to say. First of all, when Kirk Cousins came to Minnesota, there were Super Bowl hopes. I mean, he signed a massive contract with a ton of money guaranteed. And a Super Bowl has not happened. A deep playoff run, frankly, hasn't happened for Minnesota. But when you step back and realize what Kirk has done, especially this year, Kirk Cousins has 18 touchdown passes and only two interceptions this year. I knew that Kirk has had some really good games. I did not realize, oh my gosh, he's doing even better than I thought. And then look at all five of the Vikings losses this year. They lost to Dallas by four. They lost to the Cardinals by one point. They lost to the Bengals by a field goal in overtime. They lost to Baltimore uh, by with a field goal in overtime. The Vikings' biggest loss of the year was losing 14-7 to to Cleveland. I mean, the Vikings have lost every game by one score or less all year this year. And Kirk, I mean, they're 5-5. Five and five. I can't imagine where they would be without Kirk Cousins as well as he's playing. And this weekend I realized I need to give Kirk Cousins 
some respect. He's not the best quarterback in the NFL. I need to make peace with that and be like, well, look, he's never going to be Patrick Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers, and that's okay. But he should lose his job. Kirk Cousins is playing very well, keeping the Vikings in games. Number one, he's still under contract. Like, good luck getting rid of Kirk Cousins and all the money Minnesota and the Vikings owe him. But number two, Minnesota has way bigger problems than Kirk Cousins at quarterback. And also, Kirk is so likable. Like, once I kind of accepted, like, wait, I'm too hard on Kirk, and I just accepted him. I'm like, gosh, does it feel good to be able to like Kirk Cousins because he's so likable. There's a great video of him. He put it on Instagram. He's driving down the freeway. He saw a fan with a Vikings van. And it's like waving to them on the freeway as he drives by. It's just awesome. And this weekend watching the Vikings and the Packers made me realize how much more I need to give more respect to Kirk Cousins. He had the game when he drive to beat the Packers. He has had 18 touchdowns and two interceptions this year. He's playing well. And uh, let's give Kirk Cousins the respect he deserves. Uh, number five, let's talk about the Browns and their quarterback Baker Mayfield. Uh, the Browns actually won. They beat the Lions 13-10. to 10. You would not know based on watching the game or reading Twitter or anything. I mean, it didn't feel like the Browns won the game. It was a really, really ugly game. Browns quarterback Baker Mayfield was 15 for 29 with 176 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. Uh, then the Lions, by the way, started a backup quarterback, Tim Boyle. Tim Boyle also threw two picks. Uh, no offense, I, I have no idea how Tim Boyle made it to the NFL. His college career numbers are horrible. He went to two colleges. He went to UConn, and then he transferred to FCS-level school, Eastern Kentucky. Listen to this. These are Tim Boyle's career college numbers. He had 12 touchdowns and 28 interceptions. That is unbelievable. And, and then you think about, well, in all the significant football he's played recently between the NFL and college, he's had... 12 touchdown passes and 28 interceptions, more than double the interceptions to touchdown ratio. It's unbelievable. Like how, again, no offense, but how in the world did Tim Boyle make it to the NFL? I will never understand. Like there are guys who are much better than him who are at home watching football on the couch. And I'm like, I don't, I don't get what's going on at all. Like he, that's the dude taking reps on a Sunday. What, what, how, how in the world is that possible? Now, again, uh, Browns-Lions was an awful, awful football game. Cleveland really only won because Jarvis Landry had a touchdown run from a wildcat formation. And Nick Chubb, the Browns running back, had 22 carries for 130 yards. Like, he was really carrying the team. Uh, his longest run was only for 15 yards. So he was just bruising and running really, really hard. Now, I got two write-ins from Patreon. You can go to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler if you want to write into the show. Brody wrote in, he said, Hey, Zach, been a while since I've asked anything. Baker did not look good today at all. Is there a quarterback in this draft that is worth it for the Browns to give up Baker and some first round picks to go up and get? And then Brass Monkey wrote in and said, I propose a trade. Derek Carr <laughs> to the Browns. So first of all, thank you, Brody. Thank you, Brass Monkey. I've gotten so many messages about Baker, whether it be on YouTube or Instagram or Twitter, like wherever. And... They all kind of revolve around this idea, should the Browns keep Baker Mayfield or how good is Baker? Look, Baker is hurt. He is not 100%. I want to acknowledge that. Like, he's really banged up, had a lot of injuries. But here's the thing. Indecision means no. This is the fourth year of Baker Mayfield's career. He's in year four in Cleveland. He has good coaching. Kevin Stefanski He's a great coach. He's got a good general manager, Andrew Barry. He's got a ton of weapons around him. If after everything that's gone down in Cleveland, good coach, good GM, a ton of great receivers and weapons, a good offensive line they've built around him. Like Baker's had more advantages than most other quarterbacks in the NFL. If after all of that, you're still not sure he's the right guy, then that's your answer. That says enough right there. Baker ain't the guy in Cleveland. Baker's been bad and he might have been bad because he's hurt. If he's playing bad because he's hurt, then he needs to sit down and rest and get healthy because he's either hurt or a bad quarterback. Maybe both. Like, both are possible. But whether it be injury or not, Baker is ruining his career with 
bad play. He's playing horribly. And again, if he's playing bad because he's hurt, then he should sit down and stop playing for a while. Because again, if that's the reason why he's playing badly, then playing hurt could be ruining Baker Mayfield's career. At this point, there's no quarterback that Cleveland can take in the first round that would help them win right now. But that's not because Baker's so good you can't replace him. It's more because there's not a lot of great quarterback options in next year's NFL draft. Like maybe they grab somebody in the second round. I can see that happening. A guy that you're not expecting to play immediately, but you could develop into a starter eventually. But what Cleveland needs is a capable quarterback. Like no lie, Tyrod Taylor would be an upgrade over Baker Mayfield right now. And I love the idea of maybe a Matt Ryan trade, getting him out of Atlanta, putting him in Cleveland, giving him a good team around him. I'm not sure if that's financially realistic, but what needs to happen is Cleveland needs to make a trade for another veteran quarterback or a guy with NFL experience, maybe Gardner Minshew, maybe Matt Ryan. Uh, Like Derek Carr ain't going to happen, but that would be incredible. I just think Baker right now is easily the worst quarterback in the AFC North, which is unfortunate because they spent a first round pick on him. I thought he was making progress. He's regressed and playing badly right now. And and Baker, let's be clear, is holding the Browns back with bad decision-making, with inaccurate throws. It's unacceptable what's happening. And again, if you're a Browns fan and you're like, wow, is Baker our guy? We're not sure. That's the answer. You shouldn't be in year four with Baker Mayfield, especially with not the way they've supported him and still be like, You know, I'm not sure. If you're not sure, that's a massive, massive problem right now in Cleveland. Number six, the Cardinals beat Seattle 23 to 13. Seattle is now three and seven. And they just lost to a backup quarterback, Colt McCoy. (laughs) It's so bad right now in Seattle. I remember when I predicted Seattle to go six and 11 in September or August, whenever I did my season preview and predictions. And Seattle fans got so mad at me. Oh my gosh. I was like, look, there's just not a lot of talent in Seattle beyond their quarterback, Russell Wilson. And they even had Russell Wilson in this game and they still lost to a backup quarterback in Arizona. Pete Carroll might lose his job in Seattle. And I mean, he left a press conference early uh, on Sunday after losing. It was really awkward. He he left early. He did end up coming back. He, He changed his clothes and looked like he took some time to calm down. But things are really, really bad in Seattle. And yeah, Russ had two fumbles and wasn't playing great. But I think the reality is you can't blame Russell Wilson for the problems of the organization around him. I think people are finally realizing how much Seattle depends on Russ to carry them and how inappropriate that relationship is. Like You shouldn't be leaning on your quarterback and expecting him to carry you entirely without giving him any support or or any help. And Russ has so little help in Seattle. That's the big problem in Seattle is that their team just isn't very good around him. They've got like DK Metcalf. Jamal Adams is a safety who is like good at tackling, but not very good at coverage. And they're just after that, like what else is there in Seattle? There's not a lot of talent there. They got a bunch of aging players and it's not great. So this is a wake up call for Seattle Seahawks fans to finally realize like we have to, for the love of God, we have to build a good team around Russell Wilson. We can't just lean heavily on him and it's again the word is inappropriate it's inappropriate the way the Seattle Seahawks organization so heavily leans on and relies on Russell Wilson to save them and save their bad roster number seven Kansas City beat Dallas 19 to 9 look this game was nothing like I expected I was expecting a shootout a fun matchup two awesome quarterbacks Patrick Mahomes Dak Prescott And uh, the quarterback matchup was super underwhelming. Patrick Mahomes had two turnovers. Dak Prescott had three. Uh, This game really became a defensive battle, which I did not see coming at all. And it was just kind of a weird, ugly game, a slugfest with just, man, a lot of ugly football. And Kansas City won. What I'm really curious about moving forward, like every team has a bad game. I felt like both teams had a really bad game. Uh, I want to see how... Dallas will respond. They play on Thanksgiving at home against the Raiders. And I think that's a fantastic way for the Cowboys to bounce back and realign and get back on track for the rest of their year as they make a push towards the playoffs. Now, game number eight, Carolina against Washington. There's a lot of really fun connections in this game. You have Ron Rivera, the coach of Washington, 
playing against his former team, Carolina. You have Cam Newton, the quarterback of the Panthers, playing against his former head coach, Ron Rivera. You also have Washington quarterback Taylor Henneke, who used to be Cam's backup in Carolina. It's like a, a house call for a bunch of people just playing against each other who all used to work together. Washington won 27 to 21. And uh, this was probably my favorite game to watch during NFL Week 11. Both quarterbacks played very, very well. Taylor Henneke had, was 16 for 22 passing with 206 yards and three touchdowns. Cam had a good day, too. Cam Newton was 21 for 27 with 189 yards, two passing touchdowns. He also ran 45 yard, for 45 yards and another touchdown. Cam is absolutely easily the very best quarterback Carolina has had all year. He had a sweet touchdown pass down the seam to Christian McCaffrey, and it's only been two games, but it sure looks like Cam stole his starting job back from the former starting quarterback of the Carolina Panthers, Sam Darnold. Like, Sam Darnold has not had a performance like Cam all year, and we've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and Cam is delivering. Sam did not, and it's funny. Cam and Sam, their names, but Cam is back, and Cam has his job back, and I think Cam might be like, again, I don't want to completely overreact, but I'm going to. He might be the franchise quarterback of the Carolina Panthers once again, which is a really crazy, chaotic turn of events, but it seems like the right move. Now, the Panthers had the ball late in the fourth quarter, down 27 to 21. And I, I mean, I thought we were going to see some Cam magic. I'm like, the ball, you're down six. Cam Newton's going to lead them on a game winning touchdown drive. Uh, unfortunately, or, or not, depending if you're a Washington fan or not. The game ended with Cam getting sacked on a fourth and three. We didn't see the Cam magic, but still I walked away feeling really good about Carolina. You're like, hey, Carolina might have found their quarterback that they've been looking for, by the way, for a long, long time since getting rid of Cam. Weird that Cam was the answer all along. Um, also, I want to give a shout out to Washington receiver Terry McLaurin. The dude is amazing. I cannot believe Terry McLaurin was a third round pick. The dude had five catches for 103 yards and a touchdown of the win for Washington. Well done, Scary Terry. He is fantastic. Now, number nine of noteworthy number nine, uh, the Dolphins beat the Jets 24 to 17. And I maybe, I, mean, I, got a, I got a fun idea. Should I do it? Should I do the fun thing? Of course you do. Let's do the fun thing. I'll be right back. Ah, Tua, baby, let's go. Things just keep getting more and more interesting in Miami, Tua was 27 for 33 passing in this game. He had 273 yards, two touchdowns. He did have an interception, but in Miami, they've won three games in a row now. Uh, Tua had a long, awesome touchdown pass for 65 yards to Mac Hollins. This is one of the better games of Tua's career. And I just want to say, like, as a Tua fan, I get it. I, I love the guy. I, I'm still not sold whether he's the franchise quarterback of the Dolphins or not. I don't know whether they're going to embrace him. I don't know whether they're going to build around him. I just like the guy. But I'm, I'm really curious to see how the rest of the year plays out for Tua because it seems like Tua is progressing and getting better and better every week and building off of small success after small success after small success. And I thought he was better this week than he was two weeks ago against the Ravens and it's just cool to see, man. Now, Dolphins also, the Dolphins have two young rookies. They have Javon Holland, who is an awesome safety. They've got Jalen Wada, who's playing great. Like, I just think there's something exciting going on in Miami. They've won three games in a row, and I, I really want to see how the rest of the year goes for Miami. Now, the Jets. I thought that Joe Flacco, the Jets veteran quarterback who they, they traded for a couple weeks ago, I thought he played really, really well. And there was some controversy whether... The Jets were right to make him their starter for this game or not. I, I thought he totally justified that move. I thought that he played very, very well. It makes absolute sense why the Jets made him their starting quarterback. He's a veteran. He handled the defense of Miami very, very well. And, and finally, I want to say this about the Jets. They've got this rookie receiver, Elijah Moore. He had a great day. He had eight catches with 141 yards and a touchdown. This dude is a stud. And if... Zach Wilson hits, who is their, the, the quarterback they drafted, number two overall. They also drafted a lineman, Elijah Vera Tucker, and then Elijah Moore in the second round. Like The Jets' draft class is fantastic if Zach Wilson does land. And Elijah Moore, a second-round pick, has been a home run right now. He's one of the best rookie receivers. I mean, he's up there. with He's competing with guys who are incredible. Um, but I, I really think that Elijah Moore is, is playing very, very well, and it's an underreported story how well— Elijah Moore 
is playing right now for the New York Jets. So guys, those are my thoughts on NFL Week 11. I want to take the jersey off. Give me one second. Uh, but those are my thoughts again on NFL Week 11. Okay, let's now talk about college football. There are three games from this weekend I want to talk about. First is this. We had a game between number two Alabama and number 21 ranked Arkansas. Alabama won 42 to 35. And I got to say, I was wrong about this one. I believe that Alabama would dominate. And the fact that Alabama did not dominate is concerning to me. Georgia dominated Arkansas 37 to zero. It wasn't even competitive. And uh, Arkansas never led against Alabama, but they hung around and Alabama had a hard time kind of putting them away. This game made me wonder, is there really any team in college football who can compete with Georgia? I've been thinking all year, like the only team that can do it is Alabama. And, and maybe that's true. And we'll talk about maybe Ohio State has a shot, but maybe no one can compete with Georgia. Georgia is on a whole another level. I mean, the way they dominated Arkansas was nothing like the way that Alabama played Arkansas. And that's a great litmus test to go, make you go. Yeah. There just might not be anybody who can really compete with Georgia all year. Now I do want to give a shout out to Alabama quarterback, Bryce Young. The dude was amazing against Arkansas and good quarterback performances deserve praise. Bryce Young against Arkansas was 31 for 40 passing. He had 559 yards, five touchdown passes, uh, he he threw a really sweet back shoulder fade early in the game. He had a long touchdown pass in the second quarter against really good coverage, but it was just a perfect throw to Jamison Williams down the middle of the field. Again, he wasn't really wide open. He just, you know, Bryce Young made a perfect throw. And uh, man, like the way Bryce Young extends plays is fantastic. He had a sweet play where he moved to keep the play alive and he was attacking the line of scrimmage. And at the last second, he flipped his hips and threw the ball out wide to his check down for a big gain. It was awesome, man. Bryce Young is incredible, and I, I just, I, I really think that Bryce Young is one of the best young quarterbacks in college football. It's so fun to watch. By the way, though, I do want to give one more thing, a bit of respect to Arkansas. Arkansas had a fantastic fake field goal touchdown pass where the, the punter catches the, the snap, did like a jump pass through a, a throw behind a receiver who made a great one had to catch rain for a touchdown well done by Arkansas all around in this game. They hung around with Alabama. They competed really hard. And I think this game was a statement that really kind of shows how amazing George's football program is. Now, let's talk about Ohio State. I have a dream. I don't think it'll happen. But I, I desperately want to see a college football playoff game between Ohio State and Alabama. I want to see Bryce Young against C.J. Stroud. A battle of two amazing young quarterbacks in college football. Ohio State absolutely dominated Michigan State on Saturday, 56 to 7. I mean, it was 49 to nothing at halftime. Ohio State was not even, it wasn't even competitive. They just dominated, absolutely dominated Michigan State. Ohio State quarterback C.J. Stroud was 32 for 35 passing. He had 432 yards and six touchdowns. He had two times as many touchdown passes as he had incompletions. That is absolutely unbelievable. He's one of the best young quarterbacks in college football. I think CJ Stroud had probably one of the best, if not the very best game of his career so far, his decision-making, his movement in the pocket, the dude was on fire. And honestly, I want to see Ohio state play everybody. I want to see Ohio state play Alabama. I think that'd be really fun. And I want to see Ohio state play Georgia because Ohio state has these three amazing receivers. They have three guys who went, had over 100 yards receiving against Michigan State. They had you know Jackson Smith and Jigba, who had 10 catches for 105 yards and a touchdown. Chris Olave had seven catches for 140 yards and two touchdowns. Garrett Wilson had seven more catches for 126 yards and two touchdowns. And the way Ohio State's offense produces yards is ridiculous. They also ran for 206 yards against Michigan State. I mean, every part of their offensive game is dominating. And... I am not confident that Ohio State could beat Georgia, but this offense is the offense that has the best chance in all of college football to be able to score on Georgia. And I really want to see Georgia's defense try to defend these three stud receivers that Ohio State has. Jackson Smith and Jigba, Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson. Like, what would their game plan look like? And and then, you know, every week I watch C.J. Stroud, he gets a little bit better and a little bit better and 
to me, Ohio State football is very, very interesting. I, I just, we're going to get some kind of good matchup with them in the college football playoff. In a perfect world, they find a way to match up against Alabama and then next maybe Georgia. But I just want to see Ohio State's offense compete against an SEC level defense because they're just shredding people right now. And they lost to Oregon earlier this year, but I think CJ Stroud has gotten a lot better since that game. And um, I just, I'm so impressed right now with Ohio State football. Game number three, uh, we had a really big upset right now. Right now, I don't know why I said right now. We had a really big upset this weekend in college football. Number 23 ranked Utah. Not only beat number three ranked Oregon, Utah dominated Oregon. Utah led 28 to nothing at halftime. Utah beat Oregon 38 to seven when it was all said and done. Britton Covey, who's had a really good career at Utah. Britton Covey had a long punt return touchdown as time expired going to halftime against Oregon. Oregon just got flat out dominated in every phase of the game. On offense, on defense, special teams, Utah had a punt return touchdown. Utah blocked a field goal. It's a great win for Utah all around. And I love, love, love the program at Utah. Kyle Whittingham's awesome. If I was a young quarterback in high school, I would be like, man, I'm getting myself to Utah because they're going to run the ball well. They're going to play good defense. All they need is a quarterback like every year. They're like the Wisconsin or the Iowa of the Pac-12. And they win games. Like, they're a really good program. Salt Lake City is really cool. I've been there. Went to a game there once. Um, This is just a fantastic, fantastic win for Utah. Also, shout out to Tavian Thomas. Tavian Thomas had three touchdown runs for Utah. He broke the school record for most touchdown runs in a single year. Dude is a stud. Great win for Utah. Now, Oregon, college football playoff chances for Oregon are basically nothing now. Uh, this is a tough loss for them that I don't know that they will be able to recover as far as making it into the top four. And you, you just every year, the, the Pac-12 is so competitive and so close. And in a vacuum, the Pac-12 is really, really competitive. But the reality is that every year the Pac-12 beats up on each other and no one ever dominates enough to make it in. So I thought this was the year that maybe Oregon made it into the college football playoff, but Alas, they couldn't do it. And I, you know, I got to say, I don't love Oregon football fans. I grew up in the Northwest. I grew up in the Portland area. And I I was always a fan of college football, period. I was never loyal to the area. And Oregon football fans are always so delusional. They talk about beating Auburn and beating SEC programs. And the reality is that Oregon's football program is nowhere near an SEC level program. And until they dominate the Pac-12, I'm so tired of hearing about how great Oregon is and oh Oregon's amazing this is the year I'm like stop overhyping Oregon until you dominate the Pac-12 the way that USC used to dominate the Pac-10 with Pete Carroll and Matt Leinert and Carson Palmer you're not that and until you're that can we please relax a little bit with all the Oregon talk it's just as as a person who I love and respect the SEC I love Alabama football I love watching Ole Miss I love watching Texas A&M I love watching LSU I love watching Florida I love watching Georgia I love SEC level football and the way that Oregon football fans talk as if they're an SEC level football program just isn't true at all and it man it it really really grates on me all right as promised let's now have a turkey debate let's talk about Thanksgiving first of all let me say Thanksgiving is all about being thankful and today I am thankful for my sponsor Hisense they have the Hisense U6 ULED TV, the ultimate big game TV. Hisense right now and through the end of the year is so confident in their product. They have a special 100-day no regrets guarantee. Again, they're so confident in their product that for 100 days after buying it, if you decide you don't love it, they will give you your money back, a full refund. If you're in the market for a new TV, I recommend the Hisense U6 ULED TV. I have a Hisense TV. I'm using it right now as my monitor. I bought it uh, myself. It's my TV for TV, games, movies. I use it as a monitor sometimes for recording. Check out the Hisense USA Instagram account for details on the Hisense Turkey Bowl. I'm participating in that this week. Now, let's talk about Turkey Day. There are three big games on Thanksgiving. The early morning game, 1230 Eastern Time. You have the Bears at the Lions. Then the main course at 4.30 Eastern time, you have the Raiders at the Cowboys. And the nightcap is the Bills at the Saints. I want to go through all three of the games, make my picks 
uh, on who will win on Thanksgiving. And uh, here's what's fun. We get to learn who is smarter, me or a turkey. I think some YouTube commenters would tell you, they would not be shocked to tell you that a turkey is smarter than me. Uh, the turkey I am debating today is Mr. Gobblestone. I'm making my picks. He is making his picks. We will see who is right on Thursday. Game number one is the Bears at the Lions. I would be absolutely shocked if the Lions found a way to win this game. I am picking the Bears. Now, there's a lot up in the air about this game. Number one, Lions quarterback Jared Goff is hurt. He likely will not play. And Bears quarterback, rookie Justin Fields, he left the game against Baltimore during week 11 with a rib injury on the first drive of the third quarter. So we might get two backup quarterbacks, Andy Dalton against Tim Boyle. Andy Dalton for Chicago, Tim Boyle for Detroit. Uh, frankly, I believe that both of the Bears quarterbacks, whether it's Justin Fields or Andy Dalton, are better than any quarterback the Lions could put on the field on Thursday, let alone... <laughs> Tim Boyle, I, I, I mean no disrespect. I don't really understand how Tim Boyle made it to the NFL. In college between UConn and then he transferred to an FCS program, Eastern Kentucky, Tim Boyle threw 12 touchdowns and 26 interceptions in his college career. Again, no idea how this guy made it to the NFL. Now, in the NFL, he has zero touchdowns and two interceptions. So in his recent football career, Tim Boyle has 12 touchdowns and 28 interceptions between the NFL and college. I am very, very confident the Bears will win. The Lions are 0-9-1. So I am picking the Bears to win. Let's see what Mr. Gobblestone chooses. Let's get Mr. Turkey on screen. Oh, they're giving him food. That's how they're going to motivate him to make his pick. So he's cleaning himself. Bears, Lions, who will Mr. Gobblestone choose? We're going to learn a lot about this little turkey from this pick. He's looking. He's trying to make his pick. And he picks the Lions. Oh, right. Let's go. At this point, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm not sure that this turkey knows much about football. Game number two is the Raiders at the Cowboys. Both teams are coming off of a loss. The Cowboys lost week 11 to Kansas City. The Raiders lost to the Bengals, I believe the Cowboys will win this game. They're more talented. Uh, the Raiders' defense, in my opinion, is going to get shredded by Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott. The Raiders have, man, they've had so many off-the-field issues this year. Their year has been basically completely derailed by off-the-field stuff. They've lost three games in a row. Now, Dallas will not be 100%. They will not have receiver Amari Cooper playing. Uh, C.D. Lamb, another receiver, might also miss the game. I don't love that. But Dallas is coming off of a loss to Kansas City where their offense didn't play great. I believe the Raiders' defense is exactly what the Cowboys need right now. Playing against the Raiders' defense is going to be a really big boost of confidence and, and an opportunity for them, the Dallas Cowboys, to get back on the right track. I am picking Dallas. Let's see who Mr. Gobblestone will choose. Got the Cowboys on one side, Raiders on the other. I mean, there's a reason why we eat turkeys rather than looking to them for advice on football games. And this poor turkey has no idea who to choose. He's looking around. He's trying to decide. And he picks the, the Raiders. Oh, poor turkey. Man, Mr. Gobblestone. Yeah, man, I'm not convinced. Uh, this might be shocking to people, but to me, <laughs> turkeys don't know very much about football. Now, game number three is the Bills at the Saints. Buffalo is coming off of a... Really bad, really ugly loss to Indy. And a Thanksgiving game against New Orleans might be exactly what they need. To me, Buffalo is a playoff team, maybe even a Super Bowl contender. And if that is true, then the Bills will win on Thanksgiving. Now, Saints quarterback Jameis Winston tore his ACL a few weeks ago. That made Trevor Simeon the Saints starting quarterback. And they are 0-3 since Jameis Winston got hurt. That's not great. I am picking the Bills to win on Thursday, on Thanksgiving. Now, let's see what Mr. Gobblestone chose. You got the Buffalo Bills and the New Orleans Saints. Who will Mr. Gobblestone choose? He looks around very thoughtfully. Clearly, there's a lot going on in that tiny little bird brain of his. And, oh, oh I thought he was going to pick New Orleans. He kind of faked us out there. Now, he's looking around a little more, pondering, kind of struggling with a choice. And was that Buffalo? No, not quite. And, oh, there he does. He does pick Buffalo. Wow, I agree. Well done, Mr. Gobblestone. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it looks like him and I agree. Now, is that bad? I've been saying all along the turkey doesn't know football. So is it concerning that him and I agree? Maybe it's just so clear that the Bills will win that even a turkey 
can see the clear option. I don't know. But in summary, I picked Chicago, Dallas, and Buffalo. Mr. Gobblestone chose Detroit, the Raiders, and Buffalo. On Thursday, we will see who is smarter, me or a turkey. Thank you so much to Hisense. I feel like me and Mr. Gobblestone found some kind of common ground at the end, agreeing on the bills. Again, Hisense, thank you so much for providing an opportunity. I don't know when again in my lifetime I'm going to get to debate a turkey. Check out the Hisense USA Instagram account to participate in the High Sense Turkey Bowl. And uh, man, enjoy the games on Thanksgiving. All right, uh, let's now end the show by talking about Formula One. On Sunday, we had the Qatar Grand Prix. Lewis Hamilton won. Max Verstappen got second. He also got fastest lap. And to round out the podium, Fernando Alonso got third for Alpine. It was an eventful race, but number one, I got to say, I absolutely loved seeing Fernando Alonso on the podium. It's really, really cool. He came to Alpine trying to build something, and it really feels like that's what's going down at Alpine with Fernando Alonso. I think people don't realize how good Fernando Alonso is as a driver. Like, can you imagine if Fernando Alonso drove a Mercedes car, the battles we would have, the the, the aggressive battles with Max Verstappen against Fernando Alonso, the way they would shut the door on each other and be aggressive and emotional and probably pull all kinds of stunts that you can't get away with, really. Uh, Max versus Fernando Alonso in equal cars would be unreal. I got that thought watching turn one, the way that Fernando Alonso, whether he knew Max was there or not, the way he closed the door on Max Verstappen. And both Red Bull driver Max Verstappen and Mercedes driver Valtteri Bottas got grid penalties for not slowing down enough during yellow flags. As a result, Bottas started in sixth and Max started in seventh. Max Verstappen was able to overcome the grid penalty. He finished the race in second place. Valtteri Bottas did not overcome the penalty. He started the race in sixth. After a bad start, he dropped all the way down to 11th place and then hit a hard time passing Lance Stroll and Yuki Tsunoda. Mercedes as a team was really, really unhappy with them. They're like, they were, you know, as, as aggressively, but also respectfully as they could saying like, dude, you got to get going, Valtteri. And uh, Mercedes is very, very frustrated with him. It's pretty clear they are excited to move forward with the new driver they have next year, George Russell. On lap 33, Bottas got a puncture. He was pushing his tires basically to their limit. He was on lap 33 with the medium tires, who are they're really only good for 33 laps. He got a puncture. He had to go basically around half of the track to try to make it back to the pits. Eventually, he had to retire on lap 51, uh, you know, we suspect a lot of that was damage from basically pulling his car along the bottom of the, tra- you know, the bottom of his car along the track for a half a lap. Uh, and after Botas got a puncture, there were actually a couple other punctures right behind him. George Russell got a puncture. Nicholas Latifi got a puncture. And that made all the other teams and drivers very, very cautious moving forward. Now, here are the standings in Formula One after Sunday. The driver's standings uh, look like this. Max Verstappen is in first with 300 and 51.5 points. In second, you got Lewis Hamilton with 343.5 points. Valtteri Bottas has 203 points in third. And Sergio Perez, the other Red Bull driver, has got 190 points in fourth place. In the team or constructor standings, you have Mercedes, which is narrowly, narrowly ahead of Red Bull. Mercedes is in first place with 546.5 points. Red Bull is in second with 541.5 points. They are only five points a part of each other. Lewis won, but Valtteri Bottas did not finish. So with Max getting second and Sergio Perez getting fourth in Qatar, Red Bull actually gained a lot of ground on Mercedes. And it's very possible we see a world where Lewis Hamilton could win the individual drivers championship, but Red Bull could still very much win the constructors championship. Uh, Now, Ferrari is securely in third right now. They've got 200 and 97.5 points. McLaren is in fourth with 258 points. Um, In the last two races, Ferrari has dominated McLaren. And in Qatar, Ferrari got seventh and eighth place for a total of 10 more points. Carlos Sainz got seventh. Charles Leclerc got eighth. And McLaren's drivers got ninth and twelfth. Lando Norris got uh, got ninth place for, oh, a grand total of two points. Meanwhile, Daniel Ricciardo got zero points for finishing in twelfth place. So, Ferrari, I already thought, had a commanding lead over McLaren in the battle for third. They extended their lead even more over McLaren in Qatar. Uh, Now, Alpine pulled away from AlphaTauri. AlphaTauri and Alpine came into the race at Qatar 
tied 112 to 112. Now, Alpine is in fifth place right now with 137 points. Uh, Alpha Tauri, unfortunately, did not get any points this weekend in Qatar. Fernando Alonso for Alpine got third and 15 points for Alpine. Esteban Ocon got fifth place and 10 points for Alpine. So Alpine moved up 25 more points uh, past Alpha Tauri. And Alpha Tauri, both of their drivers did not get a points finish. Uh, Pierre Gassi was started so hopeful in second place. He finished in 11th, and Yuki Sonoda finished in 13th. So the battle between Alpine and Alpha Tauri has almost entirely been neutralized. We'll see what happens in the final two races, but I would be shocked now if Alpha Tauri found a way to move past Alpine and get fifth in Formula One. Now, as far as Max and Lewis goes, there are right now they're eight points apart. And if Lewis wins the next race and gets fastest lap while Max got second, then Max and Lewis be, would be tied going into the final race. And look, I consider myself a Max Verstappen fan, but I am not comfortable or confident right now in Max's chances to win the F1 world title. Lewis has won two races in a row. Uh, Red Bull recently has not been able to respond well to the pace Mercedes has. And while I'm hopeful, I'd love to see Max Verstappen win a world title. I am not confident. And uh, I just, I worry that if it comes down to the final race, the experience and the maturity of Lewis Hamilton is going to cause a, give him an advantage because I think Max is going to get desperate and do some kind of dumb move that's going to cost him big time uh, in his chances for the world title. It's just been an amazing year in F1. Like, all around, I look at F1, and I'm like, wow. It's just been so much fun. Lewis is in the hunt right now, uh, but regardless of what happens, we're going to get an amazing finish to this year in Formula 1. Again, we could also see a, a finish here where Red Bull could win the Constructors' Championship, but Lewis might win the Drivers' title. So, we'll see what happens, but... Qatar was so much fun, and uh, man, we got two races left. It's going to be amazing, the finish in Formula 1, and I just hope you're enjoying Formula 1 as much as I am this year. Guys, that is all I have for today. Thank you so very much for tuning in. I love you. I appreciate you. But um bum bam we are done.